I think of heritage is something which is about experience of a place, the sense of place, how you have felt in a place, the physicality of it, the green spaces, the buildings, um, and the activity that takes form, um, whether it's between buildings or within buildings. And I think for a lot of people, it's also about the intangible sense of place. So heritage is about something to which you feel connected to. Um, it might be part of your cultural experience or your historical knowledge of a space. But it's also not necessarily always a positive thing. I think of heritage is something in which we also battle over. It's worth, I think, sort of... Uh just reminding ourselves of the definition of heritage in the actual report, which I think is a really good one. Anything inherited from the past that helps us collectively or individually to understand the present and create a better future. Heritage is obviously different from history. History is a kind of object, but heritage is the story that places that object into some kind of narrative. And it's always going to be volatile as a result of that. Whose narrative is it? Where does it fit in? And what is it really sort of saying as a story? So for me, heritage in some ways sort of gets me to sort of think about whose bees are buzzing where and, and, and whose story is being told in any particular place. I mean, I'm just thinking this week, news from the, 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 the Conservative <coughs> conference, where they're sort of saying, we're going to get rid of all council estates. Now, that's a heritage question, or is it a heritage question? Well, I think I'm quite like a lot of the people I talk to in the course of my research, actually, and that when you say heritage, the thing that comes to my mind is immediately the built environment. I think of, you know, beautiful buildings, kind of monuments, those kinds of things. But actually, you scratch below the surface and you find all of those things that Maria's talked about. It's all equally important um, and all kind of playing together to create a sense of kind of identity, community, place, and a kind of broader experience. I think it's been a very important sort of philosophical position which HLF has taken for a long time now. We're not going to define heritage. We're, we're interested in what um, people come to us and say uh, matters to them, what they value as heritage, uh, who it's important to, who values it, why they do, and therefore then what they want to do with it within a project. It's broad for us, it's historic buildings, it's museums, historic parks, it's landscape, it's countryside, and it's all of those sort of intangible heritage, cultures and memories type things as, as, as well. So we do it by default in that way, but I think it's a very important principle for us not to say we've defined it and here's our list of the things which we're going to sort of go down through and tick off in sort of with lottery funding to make sure those are fixed and done properly. Uh, I'm not sure that if you're a heritage activist or somebody involved in <coughs> local authority planning for a place not to have some concept of what is the heritage of your place and how is it being used. I think that's probably more difficult, which is one of the reasons for the heritage index. Let's just explore, panel, that this, this kind of issue of the relationship between tangible and intangible heritage, the heritage of things and this kind of heritage, which is really around kind of ideas and culture and memories. I guess one problem that's associated with it is that the intangible side starts to fringe into the possibility of being almost anything. And the danger is that once heritage starts to become almost everything, we lose sight of the fact that it has to also be about very difficult choices about old stuff. The fallback answer, I suppose, is to sort of say that it's that heritage is as much about something we do as, as, as a bunch of stuff. And so let's have a continuous social uh, conversation about what's, what's taken from the past, used in the present and into the future. And that's just, that's never ending. And it immediately raises questions about, well, whose voice is being heard in that, who's making decisions, how are decisions about heritage being made? I think the intangible heritage is, is crucial, really, and actually often it's the element of, of heritage that people find tells them the most about themselves and who they are and where they're from, and they really, really value it because of that. I've recently been working on a project with 150 community groups um, supported by uh, Big Lottery grants, and actually place came up a lot, and actually it was very much around the intangible as well as the old stuff, the bricks and mortar. And I think it's kind of interesting to look at heritage when we have a changing demography as well, and look at the demographics in different communities about how they see heritage and how it's connected both to the tangible more than the intangible, depending on what the diaspora might be. What is kind of relationship between this kind of hard and soft notion of, of heritage? You know, heritage is something that explains the present but also can create that better future. It's using those things that can actually sort of push through an idea or a place. Placemaking is a very intangible idea. It's about the life between buildings. It involves those stories. In many ways, sort of heritage is one of those tools that allows that story to be told. You know, you can't build a medieval castle because there, you know, there wasn't one there. It's just like, it's just not open to you to talk about the pre-20th century history of your city. But you can create notions of identity and place and struggle which are contemporary. 
you know, Middle Keynes has a sort of 30-year history. Its sense of self, its heritage as a story can be as rich as one that spans 2,000 years. Which takes us neatly into the index. Uh, apart from the kind of simple ranking, I'll start with you, uh, Gareth. What were the things that came out of that index that, that, were, that were surprising to you? What we did was to construct uh, an assets index, so there's this, the stuff in a place, and uh, an activities index, so the extent to which um, heritage was being used, if you like. So that had things in it like participation, uh, investment, lots of things to do with sort of social activity. I thought the chances are that the places with lots of stuff would actually have probably you know, a lot going on as well. There was a bit of a relationship, but it was nowhere near as strong as I was anticipating beforehand. So you basically got the sort of three sets of places, those which are sort of in line, they've got lots of heritage, lots going on, not much, not much going on. You've got a second tier where they've got lots more activity than you might anticipate from the extent of the assets that they had. And then you've got, for us, quite an interesting third tier, which is places which are, there ought to be rather more going on in these places than there really, there really is. And that's, that's really revealing. I mean, we couldn't have done this. We couldn't have had this as a fund 20 years ago. The mapping and the software wasn't there to do that. And a lot of the data wasn't there either. In my area, which, <clears throat> which is sort of cities, there is an infinity of rankings. I can understand why one would index. I find it quite a difficult thing to sort of see what the actual results of it are. You're trying to uh, uh, sort of make a competition out of things that don't necessarily compete unless they're competing for money. And one of the driving sort of forces behind this report, I think, is, 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 is the economic. And I think that's perfectly fine. But that seems to be the plane on which quite a lot of this sort of index is is based upon, when actually what's really interesting is looking at the kind of sort of relationships and the balances between the assets and the activities. And I think that's where things are really interesting, particularly when you look at the importance of of assets and activities coming together and working together. Maria, this issue that Leo's raised, this kind of, and, and Gareth as well, this relationship between assets and participation, how would you account for this greater difference than Gareth expected between heritage assets and heritage participation? I think the one thing that's very difficult as a researcher um, is actually understanding capacity within a community and participation and what the models have been for people to participate um, around heritage. One of the surprising things for me was Tower Hamlets. Um, lots of museums, loads of archaeological digs, etc., etc. As um, visits to museums go, 10% lower than the national average. Now, why is that? And actually, I think an index like that needs to unpack it. You know, is it because actually what, what we're doing in preserving heritage isn't very good? Maybe it's because of the cuts to the local authority budgets, which are massive to non-statutory duties at the moment. I just think we need to unpack this idea about capacity building. I've never worked in a community, myself or my colleagues, and had a community say we're not interested in heritage, whatever that might be. So I, I do think that the index is, is missing something. And there's lots of activism and there's lots of interest and people get very passionate about heritage. And an index like this, you will have difficulties in trying to work out why we got to where we got to in relation to who's taking part in the decision making around heritage. That's a really big part of this. We need to unpack that more. Anastasia, tell us about the kind of class and ethnicity dimension to this question of of heritage. So in general, people from kind of lower socioeconomic groups and people from ethnic minorities tend to engage less with heritage. And obviously there's a big questions to be asked about why that is and how you close that gap and certainly we do also see areas where that gap narrows so for example in, in some work we did with HLF we found that actually um, people from kind of lower socioeconomic groups are more likely to go to parks for example than people from other groups so it, it's about understanding why that is and how we can address that more broadly I think really importantly we also see that actually when those who engage historically less with heritage do engage with it and they do take part, it can have a much bigger impact actually than the, for the kind of traditional white middle class audience. Um, it can really tell them something very important about who they are, about the culture they live in and, and society more broadly. So it, ha it can have a very large impact. So if you were to say to a young man, for example, music is full of heritage and the people whose music you listen to are reflecting a heritage of music, would that change their view of whether or not they were heritage participants? Is it that they think it's about castles? I'm sure that is a part of it, having kind of traditional notions of it. I also think it's about having heritage that reflect or heritage activities that reflect their sense of, of who they are. So, for example, um, we did a workshop some time ago in Bradford 
and we had lots of British Asian participants and they were talking about the heritage in the local area and some of, the, some of them said, well, you know, it just doesn't say anything to me about my family or where I'm from. It's not interesting to me. I'd much rather see something that plays back a story I recognise. The issue, in a sense, that Anastasia has raised there, that the notion of identity and place is a somewhat dangerous idea because it kind of gives rise to a sense of, well, we had something that was our identity, but now all this change has thrown it up in the air. And so, therefore, it might be a kind of slightly nostalgic, slightly kind of reactionary idea. Despite the sort of the increased narratives of openness that we have and the idea of social media being open, of uh, the internet being giving us access to, you know, the world, the fact that infrastructure allows us to go anywhere we want we actually sort of spend quite a lot of our time in quite small areas uh, and with small groups of people and I think it's the consciousness of the difference between what is the possibilities of, of, of openness or open city and the actual sort of spaces that we live and spend most of our time can sometimes be quite frightening often one gets most frightened about the thing which is just slightly beyond the horizon rather than the thing that is on your front doorstep. And so it's, it's, it's often making oneself or finding mechanisms in which to realise how we move around places, how we engage with other people is changing, but it's not changing in such a way that, that, that we're losing our sense of self. I think that's in some ways the sort of really scary thing. We often think that being in a crowd, we lose something of ourselves when actually we should be able to think of being in that place makes us more of ourselves. Now, that, how does that sort of fit in with heritage? I think is quite a difficult thing because that's about engaging with the place but also the narrative of that place and how do they do that? How do they get the people to come together and to meet in a public space or a museum? I don't think there are any easy answers to that. I mean, in terms of sort of cities, I think it goes to the question of trying to create places of trust, trying to, play, trying to look at questions of inequality, so heritage is just only one part of a much larger conversation of what makes an open city. How do we make identity identity for rather than identity against? And, and what is the role of heritage in that? I think the role of heritage is in that is basically allowing for this notion of flux about who we are. Um, I think we have this idea of heritage that it's the one thing that as an individual or, you know, a human race, we are part of one thing. We can only be one nationality, one race, one community, etc. And I, I think that actually things are, are changing in the way people identify themselves. We talk about communities. That's a nice kind of fluffy sound for what, what does that really mean. And actually we all connect to various communities um, along political lines, etc., and I think heritage has a really important role to play in that it should allow for that. So we talked about some of the um, visits, you know, who visits what and when and, and possibly why. Some of those visits, you know, who goes to which, which museum, are about whether or not people feel their history is, is celebrated in those areas or connected. There's a big thing about safety in this, well that's not just heritage, it's about safe cities, open cities as well. I think heritage has a role in celebrating diversity, not only in bricks and buildings, but also in the human beings that, you know, enjoy these spaces and places. And I think HLF are exactly right, actually, not to define heritage for us, though that can make it difficult, but I think actually that's the adult approach to it. Anastasia, what can you tell us about this question of identity more broadly in the sense of how people are identifying themselves in, in modern Britain? So, for example, one sense I've always had is that people find diversity easier at a city level. I think it, you're, you're right in one sense in that I think it's in some way, somewhere like London, you know, celebrating diversity as part of, part of you know, the brand of London and it's a really big part of what's kind of talked about and what's, what makes it engaging and, and a fun place to be. I think the idea that um, we all have multiple identities is one that would be quite familiar though to people up and down the country. Done, done some work in Armagh and people talk about their identity from a religious point of view, they talk about their identity as a, someone who's in, someone in Northern Ireland, they talk about their ident identity in a European context. I mean, I think people are quite comfortable with this idea, actually, that they're fluid, that identities can be fluid, and, it, and it's about finding a way to maybe kind of celebrate those newer identities that are coming in that, that might be slightly more challenging for whatever reason. When HLF looks at kind of bids that people make for investment in heritage, to what extent are you looking for those bids to reflect some a kind of richer account of notions of place and identity rather than simply, here's a building, we want to preserve it? 
I guess in a sense what your question is going to, heritage can be quite a dangerous thing, can't it? Yeah, I mean, we've got to, it's, it's sort of a handle with care thing you know, about it being put to sort of positive use. And I, I suppose what we developed is some golden rules around that, which is a uh, sense of, of, of involvement um, of people in the design and the, um, where the project has come from in the first place. Uh, always, always, always having an idea of life around heritage, you know. And if you go right back to the beginning of HLF, what's well, developed is this sort of uh, the sense of, of activity and happening around around heritage. And that's, you know, nobody gets a project for just doing capital work and hasn't done for a very long time um, from HLF. Building life around heritage is absolutely sort of a, a key as a way of sort of having that conversation about it as well. And the other thing is, I think I'm agreeing with, with, with other panellists on this one, is just the opportunities that having lots of heritage activity around in a place creates for this notion of multiple identity. And the more, more of that you've got, the more chance you've got for finding ways that people are connecting to place and to each other. I mean, in surprising ways, finding they've got connections to people which I didn't really know they had before. The piece of work that um, Anastasia, Britain uh, Things, did, did for us, my most questions were about our investment and about people's um, feelings about heritage and, and knowledge of heritage in their area. Um, but there was a question about whether people felt that things in general had got better or not. How people felt about change. The proportion of people that said that they felt, I don't think we really put a time period on it, we said in your residence in this area, whether things had got better, and it was, any guesses? It was Not 42%. Really. There is a kind of sense that one hears of people saying, well, all cities look the same, the city centre is the same, it's the same shops, it's that kind of copycat kind of thing. One of the things we have found is that city leaders... They kind of recognise that. They want to be different. But in the end, their plans look pretty similar one to the other. You know. As it happens, most uh, out-of-town shopping centres now moving onto the high street because that's where people are spending more of their time than they were previously. And so the high street is becoming, the, firstly, a place which is, um, uh, in some places, emptying out. And in other places, becoming places of Tesco Metro and these sort of identity kit kind of retail areas. And it's to do with controlling rates, um, but it's working on a coordinated basis of being determined of creating sort of spaces of that are unique or are local or if our high streets are under threat, they don't just have to be place of retail. You know, you should be able to put other things in there, whether that's a creche. You know, it can't just be estate agents and cafes. Uh, but that takes kind of bold leadership and it takes a sort of fairly firm hand over a long amount of time to create that kind of sort of space. And often um, uh, it's about filling those shops as quickly as possible and getting the rates as quickly as possible. So, Gareth, you look at lots and lots of, of, of bids and projects. Give us an example of something which you think lives up to that vision. <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to do that. Oh, I'm gonna, okay. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I'll think about um, the, a heritage asset, something which, which okay. means to me. Take something like the, 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 the swimming club in the Serpentine in Hyde Park, for example. You've got something like that, which has got a combination of urban park, collection of people, fantastic history going back over 150 years, uh, which is sort of like continue has has that intangible exp aspect to it, and a sort of a community around that. Bit of, um, a, bit of English eccentricity. Bit of well. English eccentricity to it, and some stories which are just getting passed down all the time through. The trophy, which is sort of like kept in the tradition of a club for each year, and that person's story gets told one year after another. So I picked that because I don't want to just just have a single HLF project. Nice I like it. Like it. Like it. Maria, give us give us your favourite example. So um, I guess I would choose possibly a local project, um, which is in Manor Park, um, near Blackheath. And that has recently, well, not so recently, but got heritage funding. But what I like about um, the Manor is that it's been made into a really quite fantastic library. It's opened up as well for various groups to meet. It has a film club. It's right in the middle of a park, which has a green flag. So it's, it's kind of triangulating all the, all the things that make a place livable and lovable. Um, but also it's connected to not just the good fluffy stuff about how nice the house looked, but some of the history around it. Actually, one of the reasons why that house was there was due to slavery, but it actually talks about that story as well. And I think what I like about the project is it's about the now and the present, but it doesn't forget its past. I'm thinking of being in Sheffield, and which I think is a, sort of a really interesting city to watch at the moment. I think it's, it's a city that's sort of working out its identity, understanding that it it no longer is that sort of industrial sort of centre, but it 
it probably will uh, sort of see a future as a kind of university town. They have changed the way that you walk from the station into the city that goes past sort of universities. It incorporates historical buildings, but it also creates this public space that sort of weaves up the hill from the station. And I think that's very clever in the way that it's, it's not just relying solely on heritage, it's combining heritage with other really sort of modern buildings as well as modern spaces. It's, it's that way of sort of creating a sort of, sort of space, using what you have, but also finding other ways of managing it. Uh, and says you're not really you're not really from the heritage sector as such, so it's a bit of a harder question for you. You could just tell us what your favourite place is. So I think maybe I'll tell you about one of the projects that struck the heritage projects that struck me most in in the work we did for HLF. In that work, we kind of identified two ways in which heritage can benefit or bring benefits to local communities. And the first was about a transactional benefit, so creating a fun place to go to kind of entertain the kids, um, generating tourist, tourism money for the local area. And the second benefit was emotional. It's, it's about heritage that celebrates an uh, aspect of, of local culture and which tells residents something personal about themselves. And of course most heritage does a bit of both. And the project, I think, that struck me most in, in the course of, of that research was Big Pit in Pontypool. Residents really saw those transactional benefits and they really valued them. But actually, everyone we spoke to had a relative, knew someone who'd been down the mines, and they felt that actually Pontypool, for Big Pit, was keeping alive that heritage and saying something really important about the history of the area. The synergy of those two aspects just worked really well there and was really valued.